If you are a Bible believer, then you believe in some things that people believe is crazy. Sometimes when people find out what a Christian believes, they believe he is living in a fantasy land. When they find out you believe God created man out of the dust of the ground and that a virgin had a baby, they automatically label you as a crazy person. You are in good company because Paul and Jesus were both labeled as crazy. Festus says to Paul, Much learning doth make thee mad. And people said Jesus Christ was beside himself. If you are a Christian, then you believe in what people see as impossible because you have a God who doesn't know impossibility. Jesus said in Mark 10, 27, For with God all things are possible. Even most Christians will think you are crazy just for believing the Bible because most Christians want to use the Bible for devotional things only. They only want to use it for comfort and counseling, which is great, but they want to leave out all the supernatural stuff. Since we are living in a time where things operate by faith and not by sight, they tend to forget that the Bible is a supernatural book and God is a supernatural God and super natural things have happened and will happen. They have also been brainwashed by movies like Avatar, Alice in Wonderland, Bridge to Terabithia, The NeverEnding Story, Star Wars, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and they grew up on the Disney Channel. So everything that seems out of the ordinary, they automatically label it as a fairy tale. And with that said, we are going to look at the Bible and study what the lost world and even a good majority of Christians would label fantasy lands. And the first one we are going to look at, what people would call a fantasy land, is the original world before man. And this is one of those doctrines that many will split up over when it really makes no difference if you believe it or not. I believe I have enough scripture to back it, so I believe it. But look at Job 38, 4 through 7. It says, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy? This land is the original earth that the sons of God are shouting about. The sons of God here would be the angels. We know this because there weren't any humans around when God laid the foundations of the earth. I don't believe there were any humans at this time. This was a world that God allowed to be ran by Lucifer and it was populated by him and his angels. In Ezekiel 28.13 it says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Can you imagine a land that had beings like this? And before Satan fell... His name was Lucifer, and he had instruments built into his very being. Can you imagine the music in this old world? Who do you think is behind all the catchy music on the radio now? Imagine the music Satan would have created back when he was actually right with God. It's a weird thought that Satan at one point actually made music that gave glory to God. And it definitely wasn't contemporary or anything like you hear on the radio now that's supposed to be Christian music. But the original earth is located between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 in your Bible. Look at it real fast. It says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And then this is where you'll have the gap. Because the next verse says, And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Isaiah 45, 18 says, He created it not in vain, He formed it to be inhabited. 
So how was the earth without form and void when God created it? If he, if it says in Isaiah 45, 18, He created it not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. This shows that there was a destructive act in between these two verses of Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. And I did a whole study on this. And you can go back and watch it. And I'm, I use the word darkness to prove that there is a gap here. But whether or not you believe it is fine. I don't make a big deal about it. So don't get bent out of shape or anything. But can you imagine what this so-called fantasy land would look like? It would be awesome if when we get to heaven or sometime out in eternity, if we could watch some of God's old home videos and see this stuff on a big plasma screen or something. And since this world was populated by the sons of God, which were angels, then you would look up and see beings flying without wings and above them you would see the heaven where God is. You know why? Because there would be no darkness separating God from His creation. Before Satan sinned, there hadn't been sin before. So God was right there with His creation. The angels could have looked up and seen God. You think that's crazy, right? That's because Hollywood brainwashed you into believing everything is a fantasy land. But look at Revelation 21:23. it says, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Notice this future city that hasn't even come yet has no need of the sun, because the Lamb is the light thereof, and the glory of God lightens it. And that is what lit up this old original earth. But when Lucifer rebelled, God brought the first flood. Not Noah's flood, there was a flood before that. Look at Second Peter 3, 4 through 6, it says, And saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. So God brought a flood, and then darkness was upon the face of the deep. You say, well, Second Peter 3, 4 through 6 is talking about Noah's flood. Then why does verse 4 say, from the beginning of the creation? Noah's flood was way after that. But imagine this world before Lucifer fell. There would be no death, no sorrow, no crying, no sickness. If the world had buildings at that time, they would have been put together by angels who needed no technology because they could have moved the stones with their mind. The cities wouldn't have been built with brick like the Tower of Babel but with stone. Nothing would get dirty, and everything would live in perfect peace. And Satan could still be reigning as Lucifer on this earth and giving glory to God if he didn't get full of pride and jealousy and want to be like the Most High. Satan had to fall somewhere, and I believe the gap in between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 is where he fell. If you look at Isaiah 14 and verse 13, it says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt, exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mat of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So Satan wanted to be like God. He wanted to exalt his throne above the stars of God but he fell and then God brought that destructive act in between Genesis 1 1 and 1 2 and then Isaiah fourteen fifteen says yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit and this brings us to the next so called fantasy land have you ever heard someone say hell isn't real all the no-hellers go to books like Ecclesiastes, which is looking at life under the sun and not at eternity. 
but they'll use verses from Ecclesiastes to prove hell isn't real. But Jesus said this in Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And people think hell is a fantasy land because they don't believe a loving God would cast someone into hell. But would a loving God give someone free access to a heaven that is perfect when that person is evil? If a man raped and murdered your daughter, would you think he deserves to go to heaven? And the thing is, you're not just. God is perfect and just and is more offended by sin than you will ever be. We are all evil, wicked, and filthy creatures, and we deserve to burn forever. Thank God He is merciful, and God offers you the free gift of salvation if you will believe on Jesus Christ, His Son, who is your crucified, buried, and risen Savior. But God can't let a lost sinner into heaven, no matter how much He loves that lost sinner. And if it's not fair for a lost man to go to hell, then it's not fair for anyone to go to heaven either. If you have been desensitized to sin, then you don't really see how bad your sin actually is. It is your fault if you don't take God's way out of hell. And the only way out is through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is either believe on the Lord Jesus Christ or burn forever. And you may not like those two choices, but you have to choose one. It's either Jesus Christ or hell. But what are some characteristics of hell? The place that people call a fantasy land or a fairy tale or a myth. Uh, Matthew twenty-five forty-one says, It was prepared for the devil and his angels. Jonah 2, 6 talks, talks about it having bars. Luke sixteen twenty-three through 25 describes it as a place of torments without comfort where people are begging for mercy and a drop of water on their tongue. You'll beg for a drop of water because you rejected the living water. It is a place where men are presently being tormented and praying that their family doesn't come to the horrible place. People have always rejected the idea of hell and called it a fantasy land. They even accused Ezekiel of speaking parables when he spoke of hell in Ezekiel 20 and verse 49. And hell will one day be cast into the lake of fire. In Revelation 20, 14, it says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And the lake of fire is where Satan goes. Satan isn't reigning in hell. He's walking to and fro in the earth and seeking whom he may devour. But at the great white throne judgment, Satan is cast into hell. He's cast into the lake of fire with the wicked from all ages. And if you're born once, you die twice. If you're born twice, you only die once. And if you're alive at the rapture and you're a born again believer, then you never die. But a lost man will die physically and die again when he is cast into the lake of fire. Hell and the lake of fire aren't the same thing. Sure, it's okay to call the lake of fire hell because Jesus does in verses like Matthew 18, 9. And when a man goes to hell into the lake of fire, he will get a body like his father, the devil. If you're lost... Then John 8.44 says your father is Satan. And Satan is referred to as that old serpent and a great red dragon. He was the anointed cherub, the fifth cherub, who represented the reptilian class. And Isaiah 66 refers to a time after the second coming where people are going into the millennium and they see the carcasses of the men who have transgressed. Isaiah 66, 24 says, And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die, 
neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring to all flesh. So it's referring to their carcasses as a worm. And notice it says, their worm and not the worm. A man in the lake of fire will get a body like a red maggot. You believe Christians get a body like the Lord Jesus Christ, so why is it so far-fetched to believe a dirty, hell-bent sinner will get a body like his father? When Jesus died on the cross, he became sin for us. And you know what Jesus said before he died? He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. So when Jesus became sin for us, he referred to himself as a serpent at that time. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. And Jesus became sin for us. People don't believe in hell or the lake of fire because it has a fire that will never go out where people will scream in agony and pain for all eternity. But you need to realize hell is no fantasy land. No matter how many times you watch movies like Drag Me to Hell or Constantine, and if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will burn in hell forever. But moving on to the next so-called fantasy land, we're going to look at what the Bible calls the third heaven. If you have been reading the Bible very long, then you have probably figured out there are three heavens. The first heaven, which is our immediate atmosphere, the second heaven being outer space, and then the third heaven, where God is. And Psalms 48.2 says, Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Deuteronomy 4.39 says, Know therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart, that the Lord he is God in heaven above, and upon the earth beneath there is none else. This is where God is sitting on his throne with the Son of God on his right hand. Hebrews 12.2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And if you are born again, you are present tense, spiritually sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. This heaven that people don't believe in is the same heaven that is the home of the angels. In Matthew 22.30 it says, For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. It is the home of cherubim who worship God day and night. Imagine looking at these living creatures as the book of Ezekiel calls them. The Bible says they have multiple wings and four faces. Ezekiel 1, 5 through 11 describes, describes them as having the likeness of a man with four faces and four wings. Their feet are straight feet and the sole of their feet like the sole of a calf's foot. And they sparkle like the color of burnished brass. They have the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. Their wings are joined one to another. They have the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox and eagle. Their wings stretch upward. Imagine being able to walk and talk with these four living creatures. And this third heaven where these cherubims are and where God is, is located above a body of water that would make the oceans of this world look like less than a drop of a bucket. Psalms 148.4 says, Praise Him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Notice it said heavens in the plural. And God's throne is sitting on top of this sea, and Revelation 4.6 calls it a sea of glass. This is why the Lord Jesus Christ wants fishers of men 
because we are under water. Psalms 18.16 says, He sent from above, He took me, He drew me out of many waters. This is the third heaven that Paul was caught up to in 2 Corinthians 12. And he wasn't supposed to talk about what he saw. But yet we have people writing books about how they went to heaven and back. And their descriptions don't even match the descriptions the Bible gives. Heaven is for real. But the movie was fake. But moving on, the Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 5.8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. If you are saved and you die right now, then your soul will go to the third heaven to be with God. So there are millions of saved souls walking around heaven as we speak, walking on a sea of glass, with the light of the glory of God shining on it, making it look like pure gold. Some believe that heaven is when things are going good down here on earth. But in heaven, the real heaven, your treasures don't get moth-eaten, and thieves can't break through and steal your possessions. Matthew 6.20 says, But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. But moving on to the next Bible fantasy land, or the next so-called fantasy land, as I should say, we see the Garden of Eden. So you had the original earth where Satan reigned as Lucifer, with the third heaven visible and right above him without darkness separating the two. Satan sinned, and then God brought the first destructive act, a flood. And then darkness was upon the face of the deep, and outer space separated the third heaven from the first heaven. Then you have hell, which I believe God created after Lucifer and many of the angels sinned. And Satan isn't in hell reigning right now. He is walking to and fro on the earth. But Genesis 1-1 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Then you have the gap here where Satan reigned as a sin, sinless creature. And then he fell. And then you have Genesis 1-2 that says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And then God recreates this earth. Genesis 1-3, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Genesis 2-7 says, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God gives Adam dominion over this earth, because Satan lost dominion. Genesis 1-26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God calls everything he made very good. So we know this was a perfect place without sin. And did you know that there are so-called Christians that wouldn't believe in this creation story? They think God used some kind of evolution to create the earth. There was no evolution involved. God made man and created a woman from the man and they had dominion over the earth. They walked around without shame or guilt of sin. And Adam named the animals and had no fear of being attacked by the animals. They had the perfect life. And that was until Adam and Eve sinned by eating off of the tree. Satan appeared to Eve as an angel of light. He appeared to her wise as a serpent. It even calls him a serpent in Genesis 3 because he is that old serpent. He beguiled Eve through his subtlety. And Adam and Eve died spiritually that day. They had the perfect life and the world to themselves with the perfect marriage. Eve would have had painless childbirth, no sickness, no disease, no weight gain, a perfect temperature, no storms and no rainy days. And that's because the Bible says a mist came up from the ground to water the earth. In Genesis 2.6 it says, But there went up a mist from the earth 
and watered the whole face of the ground. So before Noah's flood, during that time it never rained. And that brings us to our next so-called fantasy land, which is the world after the fall, but before the flood. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned, the world was never the same. Man had to work for his food, and women had to have painful childbirth just like they do now. But humans had a very long lifespan, living up to 900 plus years old. These Bible characters live so long, and you may not realize it, but Adam was alive when Enoch was alive, because they lived such long lives. If these people were living 900 plus years, then imagine how smart they would be. If a man did a certain hobby or job for 40 plus years, he would be an expert. But imagine doing that hobby or job for a hundred or 200 or 300 plus years. Imagine how good these people could be at certain things, at building things, and they would have probably really high IQs. And since people were living so long, they must have been way more healthy and in shape than we are now. They could probably run faster, jump higher, think quicker, work harder. And up until the flood, there was those cherubims guarding the way of the tree of life. So I doubt that there was any atheists when they could presently see a heavenly creature standing there with a flaming sword. And since people lived a long time, the animals probably did as well. And this could possibly be where you have dinosaurs. I don't know this for certain, but I've heard that reptiles keep growing as long as they live. And if these uh, reptiles live to be a thousand plus years old, then they would be huge and there would be some huge animals running around all over the place so imagine living in this time period where you not only have extremely old people but huge animals walking down the road and this is what makes the bible hard to believe people can't imagine things like that they want the whole bible to be just like the time they're living in now and some other frightening things walking around during that time period would be the giants that's talked about in Genesis 6-4. It says there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. So the sons of God, which Job 38 lets us know are the angels, took wives and had children by them. And these children became mighty men and giants. This isn't giants in the sense of just a real tall person. It is a lot bigger than that. Amos 2.9 talks about giants with a height like the cedars. And even Goliath was like nine and a half feet tall. So this is a world that many people nowadays would have a hard time believing existed. Especially evolutionists who hate the idea of there being giants. The Bible is an amazing book and better than any fantasy movie or book you ever got your hands on. And to top it off, everything in the Bible is real. These aren't fantasy lands, but they're real places and these are real characters. The next so-called fantasy land we will look at is the earth during the time of Jacob's trouble, or what you probably know as the tribulation. I'm going to give you some details of what it is like on the earth during this time. And I'm not going to give it to you in any certain order. I don't believe the book of Revelation is in chronological order. But that is another study that we won't have time to get into now. I'm just going to show you some of the horrible events that take place during this time period known as the time of Jacob's trouble. And many people have a hard time believing that the earth gets into this kind of shape that it's going to be in and th that is why they would label it a fantasy land but this will be a future time period without the body of Christ the body of Christ is said to leave in 1st Thessalonians 4 Jesus describes the state of this world during this future time period in great detail in Matthew 24 
I'm going to show you some of the things he said. He points out that many will be deceived by false Christs and that there will be wars and rumors of wars. He says nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, and this is just the beginning of sorrows. He points out that God's people will be hated and killed. There will be hatred and betrayal. Many false prophets will rise and deceive. Iniquity shall abound, causing the love of many to wax cold. The Antichrist will stand in the holy place and claim to be God. Jesus said that there will be great tribulation that this world has never seen, and this world will be as it was in the days of Noah, with people eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Revelation chapter 8 shows us more horrible things that will happen on this world. There will be hell and fire mingled with blood, and a third part of the trees are burned up. A great mountain burning with fire is cast into the sea, and a third part of the sea becomes blood. A third part of sea creatures die, and a third part of ships are destroyed. The star Wormwood falls into the sea, and many will die from drinking the waters. A third part of the sun gets smitten, and a third part of the moon, and a third part of the stars. In Revelation 9, an angel is given a key to the bottomless pit, and he opens the pit, and locusts come out with stings in their tails that are likened to scorpions when they strike a man. Men shall seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. People will try to commit suicide, and it won't work. They would rather die than face the torment of these horrible creatures who are tormenting them day and night. In Revelation 9, the Bible says four angels are loosed out of the great river Euphrates, and they slay a third part of men. It also describes an army of 200 million. It describes them in great detail in Revelation 9, 17 through 19. Revelation chapter 11 talks about God's two witnesses, Moses and Elijah. And fire will proceed out of their mouth and devour their enemies. They will shut heaven so that it will not rain and turn the waters into blood. They will cause trouble for the Antichrist and every God-hater on this world so much that they will make merry and send gifts when the two witnesses are beheaded. This same Antichrist that has these two men of God killed will die in the middle of the tribulation and be resurrected. Then he will sit in the temple of God and claim to be God. He will make all men rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. And if they don't do this, they won't be able to buy or sell. To many, this is a fantasy land because of the scriptures about the demonic locusts and the resurrection of the Antichrist and all the supernatural things that happen. But the Bible is true and God is true. And any man that says the book is lying, he is a liar himself. That's why God said, let God be true, but every man a liar. This is a time period you don't want to go through. And if you don't want to go through this time period, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The so-called fantasy land you want to end up at is called the Millennial Kingdom. At the end of the tribulation, the Lord Jesus Christ comes back with ten thousands of his saints and slays all the God-haters with the sharp two-edged sword that comes out of his mouth. A lake of fire will be formed at that time where people will be in danger of being cast bodily into it. And you can read about that in Isaiah 34. And at this time the Lord Jesus Christ will set up his kingdom and he will rule and reign for a thousand years. It will go back to like it was before the flood with people living a very long time without dying. Isaiah 65.20 says, There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner being an hundred years old shall be accursed. And the wolf will lie down with the lamb. You can have a wolf for a pet if you want. And no, the Mandela effect hasn't changed the Bible. You're living in a fantasy land yourself if you think the Bible has changed. Isaiah eleven six says, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. In this kingdom there will be no prophesying, because everyone will know the Lord. And if you do prophesy, then you will be put to death. Zechariah thirteen three says, And it shall come to pass that when 
any shall yet prophesy, then his father and his mother that beget him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord, and his father and his mother that beget him shall thrust him through when he prophesieth. In this kingdom there will be millions of sinless beings walking around in glorified bodies. This is the born-again believers, the ones who got saved and received new bodies at the rapture. They are ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. The ones who live for Him will have rule over more cities than those who lived for the flesh. I don't think anyone is going to lack faith or need faith during this kingdom because they will see people walking around and even flying around at the speed of light in glorified bodies. Also, there will be millions of people who don't have glorified bodies that will go into the millennium from the tribulation and they will have children. They will be able to physically, visibly see Jesus Christ reigning on the throne. The devil will not be accusing the brethren at this time or trying to tempt people to sin because he will be bound for these thousand years in the bottomless pit. At the end of the 1,000 years, he will be loosed out of the pit. And the book of Revelation says in verse eight, chapter 8 and verse 20, And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. So even though everyone could see Jesus Christ reigning during this kingdom, many of them will still rebel and turn to Satan and join his army. But the battle doesn't last long. If you look at Revelation 20 and verse 9, it says, And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and could pass the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. After this, the devil will be cast into the lake of fire, along with the wicked from every age. And this brings us to our next so-called fantasy land, which is the new heaven and the new earth and new Jerusalem. Revelation 21, 1 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first, first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And Hebrews 11, 6 says, But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Hebrews 13, 14 says, For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. So there is a city prepared for us that is greater than any big city down here and way better than the first city which was built by Cain in Genesis 4, 17. And Revelation 21, 10 says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And the city lieth four square and the length is as large as the breadth and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And the Apostle Paul calls this new Jerusalem the mother of us all in Galatians 4.26. And that is why science fiction writers call giant UFOs motherships. In Proverbs, Proverbs 29.15 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom. But a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Our mother is New Jerusalem, not Mother Earth. And we bring New Jerusalem to shame if we don't stay in fellowship with other believers. We don't want to be a child left to himself. Colossians 3, 2 says, Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. New Jerusalem is said to be above in Galatians 4, 26. So we should set our affections on it. The Common Man's Reference Bible has a great footnote on the subject of New Jerusalem. David Hoffman wrote on page 1885, The splendor of New Jerusalem will exceed the ability to describe it. The shape of the city will be like two pyramids with the bases attached. The two capstones will make up the top and the bottom of the city with a wall around the middle of the city. It will exceed 1,200 miles in height, length, and breadth. It will be made of pure gold. The wall will have twelve gates with the sparkling splendor of precious stones. The bottom point of the city will be near the new earth as the, as the city floats and glistens around the earth as a satellite. This will be a place without sorrow. Revelation 21, 4 says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, 
neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And Revelation 21, 25 through 27 says, And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. There won't be any such thing as night time there, and there won't be any darkness. The glory of God will lighten the city, and there won't be any devil, devils, or wicked people to kill, rape, steal, and destroy. You will live in perfect peace without sin. Revelation 22, 1-4 says, and, I, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And then Revelation 12:14 says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. The people without glorified bodies will get eternal life off of a tree. We are already received eternal life when we got born again. But imagine seeing the throne of God in a pure river of water proceeding out of it that is clear as crystal. Most people would say this is a fairy tale. The new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem will go on forever, on throughout eternity. It will continue to grow and will be a never-ending story where people will never grow old. The new heaven is for the Gentile. The new earth is for the Jew, and new Jerusalem is for the bride, and that is the Gentile bride, not God the Father's bride. Remember, it was prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And to close this study, we will read Isaiah 9-7, which says, Of the increase of his government and of his peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this.